Now, if you've been watching the news lately, you would know that the sun's been pretty pissed off with us lately. What most don't realize is that this is only really the beginning. Over an 11 year cycle, there's something called the solar maximum, which we are soon entering. And the year of 2024, quickly approaching, is going to be the point of most activity that we're gonna see from the sun. Now, what exactly has been happening and what could we expect? Well, there's something called solar flares and CMEs or coronal mass ejections. Just like weather on earth, there is space weather and the sun is a big part of that. What the sun will do is emit these solar flares and coronal mass ejections, essentially charging particles and shooting it in all different directions. Just a few days ago, earlier this week, there were multiple CMEs, and those actually hit Earth yesterday. Most people are like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna see the Northern Lights down in the Midwest and central parts of America. I've never seen that before. And while the Northern Lights, I'm sure, are absolutely stunning, I hope to see them one day, this is really the only good side that we have to seeing these giant storms, geomagnetic storms, shooting our way from the sun. The life-changing consequences that we could see and inevitably we very likely will from the sun in the form of these CMEs and solar flares is devastating. It could end everything and that's not me being dramatic. It turns out that this is so important that NASA has even agreed and started building a 30-minute response warning system essentially, kind of like a hurricane warning when a geomagnetic storm of devastating proportions is coming our way. But that tells you that even the government is kind of worried about these things, and they should be, because just in 1859, just as if it was yesterday, 150 years ago from today, we had something called the Carrington event. And this was a massive geomagnetic storm caused by a coronal mass ejection that hit Earth. And what ended up happening was, back then, we didn't have a lot of electronics. What really was mostly impacted was the telegraph lines. So the telegraph communications, they weren't able to go through. It did cause some damage, but nothing like it would cause today. But for most people, I'm sure it wasn't a huge deal. It was something to talk about the next day. But what ends up happening in a civilization that has progressed to the point that we have in our information age, you've got the internet. You have these things that you are talking on every day and you rely on for getting around town. You have obviously other critical infrastructure and devices in your home, appliances such as fridges, freezers. So the Carrington event was really this thing that we talk about and it happened back then, but you know, not many people put too much thought into it. These storms, just like volcanic eruptions, these are inevitable. The sun will continue to emit these massive storms, almost like gunshots, from the sun going into random directions. If that happens to be targeted at Earth, we've got a serious problem. Now, Earth has this magnetic field that will protect us from so many things in the universe but it has limitations. And if a coronal mass ejection is strong enough, like we saw just 150 years ago, it could wreak havoc. With the infrastructure we have today, we have power lines everywhere. We have little phones and iPads and fridges and freezers and just the lights on in your house. Your vehicles nowadays are ran on computers and electronics. Really, you can equate it to an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. Same consequences of somebody launching a nuclear bomb into the atmosphere over our country and having the same effect on electronics. That pulse essentially would disrupt and overheat the circuitry of many devices. But it's not like we have really great testing that shows exactly what kind of damage would occur to what type of devices. It's hit or miss is how I see it. But if it was anything like the Carrington event in 1859, the damage to today's infrastructure would be catastrophic. Some of the infrastructure that we have, we actually get from overseas, and it can take 12 months to 18 months to actually build some of these components to then ship back overseas to America and then to have installed. It would likely not occur in 12 to 18 months. 
all the while with power being out because the infrastructure has been completely haywired, you have fridges and freezers that are no longer cooling food and families going to the grocery store and the trucks aren't running. And then we get into the very short time frame that stores would be completely stripped. You'd have looting of pharmacies and it just goes on from there. This may seem dramatic to you, but this is a very real possibility. And if you look at the damage caused by an EMP, if there was a nuclear war to occur, you're looking at very similar situations, only the sun is just doing its thing. It's just existing. I'm gonna let you take your imagination as far as you'd like to just see the chain reaction and the total devastation that that could cause. And when you think about it, I was reading the article of NASA having this 30 minute warning system. What good is that gonna do? The CMEs that hit earlier this week, it took a few days to hit, but the faster CMEs can hit as soon as 15 hours. And if NASA knew that this massive killer storm was heading our way, would they really tell us? But regardless, 30 minutes is nothing. And there's not much you can do in 30 minutes. But of course, there are things that you do control. There are things that you can do to prepare yourself for the coming year. I'm not saying a giant CME is gonna wipe out the earth next year, but what I am saying is that it's the increased highest chance, highest probability within the 11 year cycle that we could see a lot more CMEs, solar flares being emitted from the sun. So I would say it's a good time to really understand what that means what impact that has on us as people of this globe and do what you can to prepare. Prepare for a situation where you don't have power for a few hours, for a few days, for a few months, if you really want to get into it. And for the same reason that we have insurance on cars, we have home insurance, you have all of these insurances in your life and some being required by law, we don't have any kind of insurance ingrained in us to have food staples and clean water in case of emergencies, natural disasters, war. Some of the things that you can do with your existing electronics like communication devices or generators, power stations, is you can get EMP proof shielding. And you gotta be really careful with this stuff. There's a lot of this cheap shielding online. I would get quality, researched, tested, in a lab shielding and i'll put some items in the description below and the internet while we have it is great right you're able to research and look at youtube videos and see what other people are doing i would stray away from the metal can method and go with something that has a little bit more research behind it but that's just me now what i would highly encourage people to do now is focus and do research on how you could realistically produce power for yourself and your family if you had to. If power went out for a few hours, the electric company's not producing for months, potentially, years, what would you do in that situation? Well, the most ideal situation in my book is you aren't dependent on power of any kind. You are off grid. You know how to at least have the infrastructure set up yourself, a homestead where you could produce your own food, clean water, and you could get by with what you had. But let's be honest, for most people, that's not a realistic scenario. It's just cut the cord, go off grid. I know a lot of people would love to do that, and they can't right now. It would just take a long time. Maybe it's just not your lifestyle. You don't want to live that way. I'm sure the vast majority of the civilization would not want to live that way. That's totally fine. But there are some options that you have available to you to make sure that you can produce power. And I'm not gonna get into the operational security here. Gas generators produce noise. If you are the only one on your block or community that has power and lights on or a gas generator that you can hear from a very far distance off, you're gonna to wanna to be careful about attention that you are bringing on yourself. So I'm not gonna get into that here in this video. I've covered it in other videos, I'll cover it in the future, but just take that into account with these options. Now, I do a ton of videos and reviews on solar generators or power stations. And actually, let me know in the comments if you feel I've been doing too many of those. 
I love the things, but if those just aren't of interest or you feel I'm doing too many, let me know in the comments. And there are of course gas generators, which are great and the vast majority of people producing their power when the electric company is not functioning. Diesel is another option, propane, you have options. Fuel, gas, does not last forever. There's also wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, all these methods of producing power, but most of those are gonna be out of reach for us mere mortals that don't have just loads of money sitting around. So if you can't cut the cord and just go off grid and just not use devices of any kind that requires electricity, that would be my go-to. If that's not realistic, you're looking at gas generators, solar generators or power stations, which I think are gonna be the most easily attainable. There's massive deals going on this month and probably going through the Christmas holiday so if you are interested, EcoFlow, Bluetti, I'll pop a couple videos and links in the description if you wanna see more detailed reviews on those and how you would use them, how you would charge them. But don't just think that buying a power station or a gas generator is gonna have you set. No matter what you do and go out and buy, if that's the case, think hard about what it's going to get you. A gas generator, you're gonna to have to store fuel. You're gonna to have to store propane. You're gonna to have to think about how long that generator could get you, the operational security, you gotta think about a lot of things. Power stations are great, or the solar generators, because they're quiet, they don't make any noise, but you need a way to power them, or they're, they're gonna discharge pretty quickly on you and that's it. You need solar panels, you need other ways to produce power to store into these batteries, because that's essentially all that they are. What I'm getting at is these aren't long-term solutions you have to build up on it. You need considerable battery storage. You can do this DIY as well, many do. You need solar panels to produce that power. You need a way of protecting all of these devices through shielding. And even after that, if you ask me, there's no guarantee that that stuff's gonna work after an EMP or a CME. So something to consider, you should always be prepared and ready to take on and survive and ideally thrive in a situation, a natural disaster, doesn't have to be losing power, could just be losing your job, save up and prepare for that rainy day financially. This is all about preparation and I want you folks to be safe out there. Really think about if the lights went out, instead of guessing and hoping that they come on within a reasonable time frame, and you don't lose the food in your fridge and your freezer, Think about how you can produce power and keep those things running yourself. All right, folks, as usual, stay safe, stay practical. I'll see you on the next one.